Well, hey guys, how you doing? Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Thanks for being here. Always fun to have you here to talk about these fascinating topics that we cover here on the Opening Minds channel. I wanted to give you an update on Cold Fusion Leonard and even uh, some of the devices that are related to this topic. I got this question from someone recently at the SSC conference uh, last July. They wanted me to give them an update on the ECAT. And uh, I've been thinking about it and doing a lot of research. As you know, I've uh, been looking into uh, this sort of condensed matter, coherent matter sort of processes. I've learned a lot from the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, uh, Bob Greener. And what we've learned from studying this whole area is it's, it's more fascinating than I even thought it was going to be. And I've been able to tie in a lot of leads back to the subjects we've been looking at on this YouTube channel for uh, over 10 years now. So as you know, I've done a couple videos before on the cold fusion process. Uh, we had... Uh, Vittorio Violante from Italy give us a presentation. He's from the organization ENEA in Italy. He came to the SSE meeting in San Francisco. I think it was 2014. And he told us that cold fusion was uh, the opposite of junk science or pathological science. These sort of negative labels that have been given to the subject matter he said no they had reproduced it in their labs in italy but it was a very finicky reaction it's hard to get going he said sometimes it could take as long as two weeks in their laboratories and this can be done in a variety of ways uh, nikola tesla had ways of doing it with his tesla coil that was reproduced by john hutchinson uh recently the canadian uh, researcher, he was able to do this in his labs. We had Kenneth Shoulders uh, look into how John Hutchinson was doing his uh, research into this subject and was able to confirm that John Hutchinson had produced real results, which is also something that uh, John Alexander wrote about in his book, Reality Denied, which was really quite interesting. He had actually visited Hutchinson with a group. So this process turns out to be real. What, what happens is that the electrons form what some people call a charge cluster. There's this charge bunching, and the electrons lose their individual identity. Uh, normally, we think of them as uh, charged particles that want to repel. And while that's true at larger distances, at close distances, they can form one ball, one sort of giant electron what's called electron degeneracy. Degenerate electrons, because they've lost their individual identity, they form a ball. Okay, so here's the thing. Once you get this ball of electrons, it's like a mini version of ball lightning, micro ball lightning, as the Japanese researcher Takaaki Matsumoto called it. Uh, and this micro ball lightning has a lot of really interesting properties, because if you can sustain it, it can remain coherent for a long time. It has a huge amount of energy and electricity, and it keeps uh, eating other electrons and matter to sort of sustain itself. And if you have it in this palladium lattice work or, or nickel metal, kind of related metal to palladium, uh, it can push apart the ionic bonds this ball lightning because of the uh, pressure that it exerts as it moves through a molecular lattice. And in pushing these bonds apart, it can create a lot of electricity and then the bonds can come back together and it gets pushed apart. And that as trillions of these ionic bonds get pushed apart, you get a lot of electrical charges. And if you could sustain this reaction, you're generating energy and electricity, a higher COP, as it's called, coefficient of production, uh, 
than one, which means you're getting more energy out than you're putting into the process to get the charges to, you know, charge in the first place, to get them to cohere. And so that's the issue. And Vittorio Violante uh, told us that you had to have just the right size grain crystals in the palladium, which is why a lot of uh, labs were not able to reproduce the cold fusion effect. The grain crystals have to be the right size. And the palladium can't be too pure. Who would have thought it? It has to be doped palladium, impure palladium, to get the electrons to kind of form into what kind of the shoulders call an exotic vacuum object. Matsumoto called it itonic clusters. But as Bob Greener has uh, pointed out to us recently over and over again in his really excellent videos, it's all really the same phenomena we're talking about here. And we've even talked about this patent that Lockheed Martin uh, applied for in 2011. It was ten, took 10 years for it to be approved uh, using the same idea of taking these charge clusters and kind of getting them to be at the same frequency and, and, and temperature and so forth until they form a coherent sort of ball. So these are all the related processes that people are looking at from different points of view, maybe giving them different names. But the idea is if you get the, in the palladium deuterium example, what was used in the cold fusion project from Pons and Fleischmann at the University of Utah in 1989, which they were so heavily criticized for, uh, just in part because it is a new sort of, it's a, it's a newer process to us because it's a little difficult to understand and it's finicky and you have to get it just right. But uh, Violante told us, yeah, you get the grain crystals right, you get the doped palladium, it can't be too pure, a lot of labs use just pure palladium. You can generate this process, which some have called cold fusion, more recently it's been called low energy nuclear reaction, that's what these U.S. Navy labs that have been researching it call it, and many others now call it just low energy nuclear reaction. If you can get the sustained... Uh, ball clusters of electrons, these charged clusters, uh, they can, in certain materials, lead to ener electrical energy generation. And if you could sustain that process, you could generate a lot of energy. But here is the issue with it that I've learned recently from listening to the MFMP and Bob Greener is one of the talents of these exotic vacuum objects is they like to eat electrons and they like to eat matter to sustain themselves. And therein lies the issue, is the harder you push the reaction, if you keep putting the energy back into the electron cluster and it keeps growing and getting stronger and stronger, I mean, keep in mind, it's very small, but as it gets a stronger and stronger charge, it's going to increasingly transmute the elements around it in the reactor itself that you've constructed and turn them into other elements. It loves to turn things into pure carbon. And we've seen these photos from the MFMP and other uh, related researchers' experiments where you have these EVOs moving through materials, uh, things like uh, tungsten and other materials, titanium, and they turn them into pure carbon. And that's the challenge, is they destroy the context, the, the, the structure that they're in, because that's what they do. They're, they're micro ball lightnings, and they like to move around and move tunnel through things and leave these strange tracks that we've seen and all sorts of very interesting artifacts. And gradually, they transmute whatever they're in into other substances. In fact, the entire tree of life. Uh, as we found from the research of Mark Leclerc, who was able to produce these EVOs from water cavitation, of these very high ultrasonic vibrations. It's another way to produce EVOs. In any case, you end up producing all the different elements of life, including a lot of carbon, but it transmutes the metals that it's around and destroys the machinery that, that's it, that it's uh, encased in. And that's the problem, is if you, apparently if you push it to a higher COP than 2.5, uh, you know, just getting 2.5 uh, amount uh, as much electricity out as you're putting into the system. If you're putting in 100 watts, you're getting 250 out. If you push it past there, you start getting a lot of transmutation, which is very good if you want to transmute nuclear waste, which 
uh, Greener and others have proposed we should be doing with the Fukushima waste instead of dumping it into the ocean, the tritium uh, water that they have there in these huge uh, drums that they don't know what to do with. Apparently, you could transmute it with what's called the uh, HHO gas, the Omaza gas, which is also another way to create EVOs. So there's multiple ways to create these EVOs, but they're very good at transmuting materials. Nuclear reactor, uh, nuclear radioactive materials could be transmuted into harmless materials. It'd be great. We could transmute all the radioactive waste in the world into harmless carbon or in other materials that would be useful. But as an energy generation process, if you push the cold fusion liner process too high, you end up destroying the reactor that you built to sort of contain it. And the second issue is you could produce radioactive components if you really produce, push the, the reaction too far. You could get other elements beyond carbon. You could go beyond lead into some of the heavier elements which are unstable. So that's the challenge with cold fusion Leonard, which we didn't know until very recently. I mean, people knew about it, but it was I don't think it really was common knowledge, at least for me, is that the process is indeed real. All of these people that just said it was, you know, a fictitious sort of thing. Pons and Fleischmann were right. They produced a real reaction. So did John Omira Bacris. Uh, at Texas A&M, uh, and he was also uh, just persecuted for producing a real cold fusion reaction in his lab, as he wrote about in the book New Paradigm, and it's all sort of making sense to me now. He got a lot of different elements that you get from this process. When the EVOs start going to work, they transmute materials. He found tritium in his uh, the water in the solutions that they were using for this process. And the other people in his department said, it can't be, cold fusion isn't real, therefore you must have planted the tritium until someone pointed out that you can't just put tritium into a liquid solution and have it look the same way as it would if it was actually from some sort of cold fusion process. It would look different. But he was heavily persecuted. They even tried to strip him of his professorship for claiming that cold fusion is real, one of the top electrochemists in the world. So this is the type of negative reaction we could get to these processes. It is a real reaction. It creates alchemy, literally, nuclear transmutation, something that your textbooks probably told you isn't real, but it's real. So that's the issue. And there's another big clue here. As I've been pointing out for a couple... Uh, decades, we've been getting weird camera and battery failure around crop circles in different countries, even here in the U.S. when we built some, you know, with permission as, as sort of crop circle experiments. You know, in some cases, we, the farmer would come out and help us <laughs> to, to make the crop circle. And we've had these unexplained camera and battery effects. That's what EVOs do. They don't play nice with our semiconductors, Okay. When the EVOs find a kind of a metallic surface or a ground and they kind of glom onto it, they can break up. And at that point, all of the energy in the micro ball lightning dissipates all at once. You get a huge charge. And this is why Nikola Tesla burned out uh, a transformer station. I think it was somewhere in lower Manhattan, right? And this happened to John Hutchinson and... I believe there was a Russian researcher, Chernitsky, who had the same effect on his transformers. I believe this is the same effect we were seeing in crop circles the whole time. It has something to do with these EVOs uh, kind of being generated by the, the symmetry and the charge separation you can get from the static charges in, in the crop circle. And when these EVOs uh, dissipate, they create really large electrical charges that can burn out your transformers, as we had happened to a Sony camcorder when someone, uh, Ron Russell, put it down in the Danebury Triad Formation in 1997. I saw it right in front of my eyes. I mean, the camcorder got really hot as soon as he put it down on the ground. And then when he sent it into Sony, they said that the solder joints at the transformer had burned out. How is that possible? Well, EVOs would do that, folks. 
So that's the thing with Evos. That's uh, <laughs> thanks for listening to this discussion about it. But that's the thing. The cold fusion letter process is real, but it produces Evos, exotic vacuum objects, charge clusters that are very good at nuclear transmutation, which could be a very positive thing in very many ways to term, turn uh, harmful radiation into harmless substances like carbon. But at the same time, the charge clusters destroy the machinery that they're in, the reactor itself, over time. And the more energy you try to get out of it, the less sustainable it seems to be. Now, maybe someone will find a way to uh, make the Evos behave a little better <laughs> so they're not quite so destructive. And that would create a more sustainable reaction where you really are tapping into the energy of the quantum vacuum field. That would be really cool. But at the moment, they seem to be a real bunch of bad boys who don't want to play by the rules that our normal electronics uh, plays by. And if you get Evos, too many of them, and they're too self-sustaining around electronic devices, like we've seen with cameras and cell phones happen many times around crop circles and UFO sightings. Yes, even Bigfoot encounters. Anywhere you seem to have the Evos, our modern electronics don't seem to do very well. So that's, uh, that's it for the moment. That's what I wanted to explain to you. That's sort of the paradox of the cold fusion lunar process. I wanted to give you that update. Thanks a lot for listening. Put your comments in the box below. And we'll see you in the next video. Take care for now and bye.